This is Daniel Poppy, host of How to Write Good. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Throughout history, the course of sports has been shaped by one thing, the fans. From the moments you never dreamed of... the moments that still give you nightmares. Behind the bag, it gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight and the Mets win it. He's in. Patriots win the Super Bowl. Brady has his fifth. Through the good and the bad, fans have helped change the games we watch and the players we love. They may not be the most logical people. You are a factory of sadness. I'll see you Sunday. But they know their teams better than anybody. They'll blow in the ninth. You may not always see them, but you know where to find them. After all, there's nothing quite like the view from the cheap seats. Broadcasting as part of the Public House Media Network. Grab a chair and enjoy all there is in the the cheap cheap seats. seats. Oh yes, welcome inside the cheap seats. And it's just me today, John Loader with you. On the Public House Media Network, thank you so much for joining me on this Monday, March 19th. And what a crazy last week it's been in sports. It's been wild, insane, and it's really all been because of the NCAA tournament and those horrible, horrible brackets. Christian Heimel's not with me. He is that lucky duck in Mexico right now. Um, So he will be back with me next week. He wanted to do the show with me, but just could not make it work uh, from outside the country. So I am with you. Uh, alone on this Monday edition of the Cheap Seats. Make sure that you follow me on Twitter at John underscore Lauder, J-O-N underscore L-A-U-D-E-R. Um, I've basically just been bitching about how terrible I've done with my brackets, and we'll get into that a little bit more in just a moment. You can follow Christian on Twitter at Chris Heimel, C-H-R-I-S-H-E-I-M-A-L-L. And make sure that you go to the phmedia.com to check out all the great stuff that the Public House Media Network is working on right now. And finally, last but not least, go to the Cheap Seats Facebook page, like the page, and answer the daily poll question, which I will give you in just a little bit. I am done with brackets. I've had enough of brackets. I loathe them. That is it. Okay? Uh, Christian got me to do brackets this year because, of course, as you know, or you should know, the Cheap Seats had the bracket challenge. And so I felt like I sort of had to do it. So I submitted a bracket. and. Already in the round of 32, I'm toast. I had Virginia in the final four. I had them winning the whole thing. I had Michigan State in the final four. Gone. Done. At this point, anyone who thinks they know what will happen in the NCAA tournament, they are certifiably insane. You are better off having your dog pick the teams that are going to win by putting two bowls of food out and seeing which bowl your dog goes to. That's what I should have done. Because I feel like a moron every single year filling out these stupid brackets. I'm done with it. I can't do it anymore. I've had enough. I'm tired of people that can't spell college basketball doing better on their brackets than me. I'm tired of it. And I'm sure some of you out there feel the same way. I'm done with them. That's it. Finuto. No more. Six double-digit seeds won their first-round game, and multiple double-digit seeds are into the Sweet 16. Um, And I always seem to pick the wrong ones. Didn't pick Syracuse, mostly because I loathe them, okay? Got lucky and did pick Loyola Chicago, go me, but that was about it. At this point, my bracket looks like what would happen if a nuclear bomb was dropped on anywhere. It's a crater at this point, okay? I have next to nothing that's the way it should be, okay? Um, The Sweet 16's been decided. We know this at this point. Those Sweet 16 games will be on the 22nd and the 23rd before we move on to the Elite Eight on the 24th and the 25th next weekend. Uh, But what a spectacular, spectacular um, first couple of rounds of the tournament. you got to start with the 16 seed beating the one. Huge congrats to UMBC for the incredible upset. Not just a win, but a dominant one. Okay, A 16 seed has never beaten a one seed. The closest they've ever come was back when Georgetown... Beat Alonzo Mourning's Georgetown beat Princeton at 50-49. Of course, the great Princeton offense with Pete Carell beat them by just one point 
That was the closest a 16 seed had come. And many of us thought we might not see it in our lifetimes. And here we see it in 2018. And again, not just a win, but a ridiculously dominant one to win by 20 points against the number one overall seed. And look, Virginia, rightfully so, has been destroyed for this. Okay, They had an unbelievable season going 17-1 in the ACC, 31-2 overall, winning the ACC championship, and basically just making teams just melt in their hands. Okay, they hadn't given up 70 points all year to anybody, and they give up 74 to UMBC. That's why you got to love the tournament. As much as I was angry on one hand because of my dumb bracket, I was also thrilled for UMBC. It's an incredible story. A team that's never on the map for men's basketball is now a part of forever, a part of history, and it's awesome. As for Virginia, they clearly missed DeAndre Hunter. That's obvious. And look, to me, he's the only NBA prospect on this squad, and that's been part of the issue that Tony Bennett's had. He has had NBA-level talent before, of course, Malcolm Brogdon, Justin Anderson are the two that really stick out. But he relies on a slog of a game. Dominant defense and an offense that's only about 60 possessions a game, which is ridiculously slow even for college basketball, which, of course, is slower than the pros most of the time. But just, it was not enough. And with that type of offense and that type of team, Once you're down by double digits, it's really hard to come back. And Jerome played terribly. Guy was awful. I mean, they they just, they they didn't have it. And UMBC played the game of their lives. And they couldn't replicate it. They only scored 43 points. They lost to Kansas State in the round of 32, which was a huge bummer. Um, And Kansas State, of course, getting ridiculously lucky, as did Kentucky and everybody else in this region, with Virginia getting upset. But you knew it was going to be hard for them to play a game like Virginia again. They were making everything. All their shots were going down. I mean, 74 points against a team that hadn't given up 70 all year to teams like Duke and North Carolina. Uh, just an unbelievable story. And again, just one of the reasons why you got to stop doing these brackets, period. Um, of course, me as a North Carolina fan, they get blown out by Texas A&M on Sunday. I did not expect UNC to get back to the championship game, to be completely honest with you. I had them out in the Sweet 16 to Michigan, not because I don't love the Tar Heels, I do, but this was not nearly as good a team as last year. And they clearly missed their bigs. Texas A&M was dominant inside. You didn't have Isaiah Hicks. You didn't have Kennedy Meeks. Tony Bradley's in the NBA now. You didn't have those bigs, and it made a huge difference. Congratulations, of course, to Theo Pinson, Joel Berry, guys that did so much for North Carolina and for that Tar Heel blue, but... North Carolina wasn't winning another championship, so that does not stun me. I'm surprised it was Texas A&M and not Michigan or or Xavier or Gonzaga or somebody, you know, sort of later on, but I'm not surprised at all that, you know, they didn't make it to the championship game. I certainly did not expect that. Um, But, you know, once again, a team like Syracuse makes a run, and a lot of us myself included, did not think Syracuse deserved to be in. Christian and I both felt that way, uh, you know, once the brackets were revealed. And of course, Syracuse makes us all look ridiculous by winning three games. They're now in the Sweet 16. And, you know, look, they've, they've gotten it done. What else can you say? They beat Arizona State. Then they take down TCU. Then they take down Michigan State. And the game's been close, but who cares? And what a disappointment in Michigan State, one of the teams, of course, I had in the Final Four. Awful. They were terrible against Syracuse yesterday. I think they missed like their last 32 shots from the field. Something awful like that. Miles Bridges couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. Jaron Jackson was terrible. And Tom Izzo, who obviously they've had a, a really trying season there, uh, just could not get it done. And yeah, Jim Beheim is in another Sweet 16. As much as I loathe Syracuse, and they're playing a team I loathe even more in Duke, uh, you got to give them credit. And uh, that was just another... Uh, double-digit seed gained themselves to the Sweet 16. Looking at the Sweet 16 teams in terms of double-digit seeds, um, you've got Loyola Chicago and Syracuse, two 11 seeds, and that is pretty much it. Um, You've got a seven seed in Texas A&M. Moving up to the top of the bracket, uh, you've got a seven seed in Nevada who managed to beat Cincinnati. Cincinnati was up 22. Nevada comes all the way back. Uh, And then you've got Kansas State, against Kentucky because didn't have to play Virginia. Um, So, you know, just upsets on upsets on upsets. And look, as much as a lot of us sort of complained about the first four and whether that was necessary 
to move from 64 to 68 teams, it's worked because every single year since 2011 when it started, a first four team has won at least two games and made it to the round of 32, okay? Um, And most of the years, they've had a team make it to the Sweet 16 or beyond. Of course, as you remember, in the inaugural year, VCU made it all the way to the Final Four as an 11 seed. So the first four has worked, that's for sure. Um, And again, it's teams that are playing well when it matters. Kentucky was tremendous at the end of the year. Duke has looked dominant. Syracuse playing great. Michigan, who rolled through the Big Ten tournament. Villanova, who even though they struggled at times in the Big East tournament, didn't look always that great. They won the Big East tournament, and they're playing incredibly well right now. And if you gave me those five teams or the rest of the 11, so those five of the field, I'm taking those five. Kentucky, Syracuse, Duke, Michigan, Villanova, I think the winner's coming from that group of five. Now, of course, I'm probably wrong, but if you had told me that North Carolina, Arizona, Virginia, and Michigan State would all be out before the Sweet 16, nobody would have believed you. Everybody was looking forward to that Arizona-Kentucky matchup in the Sweet 16. We didn't get it, okay? Everybody was looking forward to North Carolina and Michigan in the Sweet 16. We didn't get it. So just a ridiculous first couple of rounds of the NCAA tournament. And now we move on to the Sweet 16. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what some of these teams can bring to the table in the Sweet 16. Um, I'm going to break down the Sweet 16 more in the next segment. But, again, you've only got three of the four number ones left in Xavier, Kansas, and Villanova. And right now, to me, Nova's the favorite. A lot of people pick Villanova to win the national championship. They're my favorite at the moment. But again, things could change. For all I know, Clemson could... Uh, not Clemson. I'm looking at the wrong part of the bracket. Um, you know, West Virginia could take Villanova down, for all I know. Um, they've got a great defense. So we'll see. I'll break down the uh, Sweet 16 more coming up in the next segment. Here inside the Chief Seats, John Loader with you on the Public House Media Network. Um, but UMBC, of course, was really the big story. Uh, and so was Buffalo. Got to give Buffalo some credit. Killing Arizona by 21 points. This Arizona team, though, has been up and down with all the the issues surrounding uh, Sean Miller and the FBI wiretap and, you know, the potential of $100,000 going to DeAndre Aton and the fact that everybody knew that Alonzo Trier and Aton were going to the draft. Arizona was under a cloud. Even though a lot of people picked him to go to the Final Four, I did not. I just didn't think that they were going to be cohesive enough and to be able to get past some of the drama that they had dealt with um, moving into the end of the season in the Pac-12 tournament, and it just didn't happen. Buffalo came out and smoked them, and then they got smoked by Kentucky. But Loyola Chicago, of course, has been a great story getting to the Sweet 16. Um, Nevada coming back to beat Cincinnati, tremendous story as well. Eric Musselman's team has had a tremendous season. Gonzaga, once again, not as good as last year, but as a four seed getting back to the Sweet 16. Uh, Texas A&M over North Carolina, like we had talked about. And Syracuse, those are the stories that really are the biggest ones as we move into the Sweet 16 and then the Elite Eight here in the NCAA tournament. Um, But yeah, brackets are done. I'm tired of them. You should be tired of them too. And that leads me to the daily poll question. I had a couple of other ones that I was thinking about, but I had to go with brackets or no brackets. And the answer is so simple. It's no brackets. I'm done with them. I'm fed up with them. I've had enough. Uh, All I want to do is root for North Carolina and upsets. That's it. Okay? And I also have to give a shout-out to Seton Hall, where my wife went to, my brother-in-law went to. uh, An an incredible performance against Kansas. Could have won that game. Maybe should have won the game. Only losing by four. uh, The seniors, Desi Rodriguez, Kadeem Carrington, um, Angel Delgado, the first player in... 20-something years to have uh, a 20-20 game, 20 points, 20 rebounds against a number one seed. I think the first in 40 years to do it in a loss. Um, Kevin Willer's team is going to look very different next year, but Seton Hall, an impressive uh, performance against Kansas in the round of 32. But once again, the poll question, go to the Facebook page, like the page, then answer the question, and answer it correctly. Stop doing brackets. I want to run for president on a no brackets agenda. Enjoy the tournament. Stop with the brackets. We'll be right back inside the cheap seats. 
This is Nicole Kelly, host of Loud and Proud here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Loud and Proud, where we talk about issues facing the disability community. A new show comes out weekly. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Loud and Proud. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Kanye West to bring you into segment two of the Cheap Seats here on the Public House Media Network. John Motor with you, uh, flying solo, doing it on my own this week as Christian is in Mexico, uh, enjoying himself, getting a tan, and hopefully not staring too much at his bracket, which is, I'm sure, a disaster as well. No more brackets. No more brackets. Anyway, make sure you check out the phmedia.com. Go to the Cheap Seats Facebook page. Follow myself on Twitter at John underscore Lauder, J-O-N underscore L-A-U-D-E-R. Follow Christian as well at Chris Heimel, C-H-R-I-S-H-E-I-M-A-L-L. So looking at all this carnage from the first couple of weeks, um, or the first couple of rounds, excuse me, it feels like the first couple of weeks without crazy it's been, the first couple of rounds of the NCAA tournament, where do you look to in the Sweet 16. I'm going to go region by region, give you some of my thoughts. Uh, We'll start in the South that did have the number one overall seed, and now the one, the two, and the three seed, and the four seed. So the top four seeds in that bracket, all eliminated. Gone. Done. Crazy when you think about it. Insane. Virginia, gone. Cincinnati, gone. Tennessee, gone. Arizona, done. It's it's clear sailing for Kentucky at this point, right? Just how we drew it up. The number five seed Kentucky against Kansas State, the number nine seed, and the number seven seed Nevada versus the number one, number nah, number eleven seed Loyola Chicago. Just how we all expected it. Obviously, Kentucky is the favorite. They're playing tremendous right now. Even though they're the youngest team, it seems like in the history of college basketball, they're coming together at the right time. And we know that John Calipari has plenty of turning experience and a national championship under his belt. I would be stunned if it wasn't Kentucky. Uh, I, a lot of people already thought that they were going to be the team out of this region anyway, and now they completely avoid Arizona, Cincinnati, Tennessee, and Virginia. So they had to play a 12 seed, a 13 seed, a 9 seed, and then either an 11 or a 7 to get to the Final Four. God, I hate Kentucky. Oh, so frustrating. Uh, in the other Sweet 16 matchup, House money for both teams. I would love to see either team advance. Of course, my preference would be Loyola Chicago, just because they're the double-digit seed. They're a tremendous story. And a little bit of a personal note for me, Marcus Towns, uh, who's on their squad, uh, was on Fairly Dickinson when I called games for them a few years back. Um, under head coach Greg Horenda, he transferred to Loyola Chicago, and now he's in the Sweet 16. So good for Marcus Towns and good for the Ramblers. Um, did not expect Nevada to come back, of course, against Cincinnati, but that just shows you how good Eric Musselman's offense is. They're an incredibly strong offensive team, but their defense is garbage. So can they do enough defensively to stop the Ramblers? That will be the question for Nevada. Uh, but I definitely see Kentucky coming out of this region. Um, Kansas State, eh, you know, um, whatever. I mean, they got to play a 16 seed instead of Virginia. They got very lucky. They only mustered 50 points against UMBC. I would be stunned if they beat Kentucky. But again, maybe not that stunned because that's kind of where we've been now in this NCAA tournament. It seems like nothing is truly a surprise at this point because just when you think that you've got something figured out, it goes completely opposite the way you thought that it was going to go. Um, so in the South, none of the top four seeds are there. In the East region, you're, you're the closest to the top four seeds, okay? Um, yes, there's no Wichita State because Marshall beat them. But you've got the one seed Villanova, the five seed West Virginia, the three seed Texas Tech, and the two seed Purdue. And Villanova is the team that I would expect to win. Uh, I, they're my pick to win it all now since Virginia is out. I had Villanova in the final against Virginia, and I had um, the Who's winning. But Villanova has looked so good. They keep shooting so well from three, and if they continue that, they're basically impossible to stop. I believe 46% of their offense is from behind the arc, and 
it was close with Alabama for a little while there in the first half, and then they just destroyed them in the second half. Dante DiVincenzo was hitting threes from all over the place, and when uh, Mikel Bridges and Brunson are playing like that, they're basically impossible to beat. And even though Jay Wright is known more for his teams rather than individual players, it's more about the collection typically there, he's got four or five NBA-level players. Mikel Bridges is going to be a lottery pick. Jalen Brunson's going to the NBA. Um, I would not be stunned to see Spellman and maybe even Pascal get a look. And I think DiVincenzo, with his shooting and his, his good defense, you know, maybe he you know finds himself on an NBA bench as well. So Jay Wright has a tremendous team and a deep roster, um, and, and they're my pick. I, I, I would be surprised if they did not get uh, to the Final Four out of this bracket, but because the two, three, and five seeds are still there, they, they might have one of the toughest roads. Um, I don't love Texas Tech or West Virginia, uh, even though both Big 12 teams have managed to survive and sort of get where they needed to go to get into the Sweet 16. Texas Tech beat Stephen F. Austin by 10 and then, you know, survived against Florida. West Virginia um, have has looked good. I mean, you know, they looked really good against Murray State and against Marshall. But again, that's two double-digit seeds. Villanova is a completely different animal. We know Bob Huggins' teams love to press. Um, I, I just I just don't think that West Virginia has enough. I could be wrong, um, but I would expect to see Villanova, and, I, and I'd expect to see them play Purdue. Um, but again, I, I, a lot of that depends on will Isaac Haas come back. Uh, I, I saw before the game against Butler, he was taking shots in pregame, and you could just tell that his arm was bothering him. He just you know really couldn't even move it that well. Um, so Purdue, of course, dealing with that injury, but still they've got, you know, both both of the Edwards, um, still have a couple of other big trees inside. Matt Painter has a good team. They've won over 30 games for a reason. Uh, I, I do think that Purdue will be able to get the win against Texas Tech, but again, who knows? If Haas doesn't play and if Texas Tech continues to get a good, well-rounded performance from their team, um, who knows? You know, Chris Beard has done some good stuff in his first year. Maybe they will continue. Uh, breaking down the Sweet 16 here inside the cheap seats. John Lauder with you on the Public House Media Network. Once again, please go to the uh, TCS Facebook page, like the page, answer the poll question. The answer is easy. Stop filling out brackets. They're bad for your health. Um, go to the phmedia.com. Check out all the other shows on the network. And you should be consuming us in any way possible. Uh, listen, like, review, iTunes, Spreaker. Um, Stitcher, uh, Google Play. Um, I don't care where you're going. We're on TuneIn. We're everywhere, okay? We're all over the place. Find us, listen, like it. Moving down to the Midwest region, um, you've got the one and the two seed here, but then you've got a five and an 11. Kansas versus Clemson, Duke versus Syracuse. Um, I still really don't trust Kansas. I-, I said that last week when Christian and I broke down the brackets when they came out. I understood why Kansas was a one seed. I'm not mad about that. But I don't really trust them. They didn't look amazing against Penn. I know they won by double digits, but Penn was really in that game for a lot of it. And they struggled to put away Seton Hall uh, because Angel Delgado had about a billion rebounds and also had a billion points. And Kadeem Carrington could not miss at the end of the game. They struggle against dominant interior players. Uh, Now, Clemson really isn't necessarily known for having dominant interior players, but Kansas does not have really any bigs other than Azabuki, and he was in tremendous foul trouble against Seton Hall. And their guards are good, not great, okay? Um, Makai Luke, good three-point shooter, but he's not a superstar. Devontae Graham, their best guard, eh. Malik Newman may have the most NBA potential out of all of them, uh, the transfer from Mississippi State, but even he's not unbelievable. Now, he did shoot well from the free throw line. When he's hot, he does make his threes. But to me, uh, Kansas, I just don't know if they're going to be the team out of this region. I like Duke, as much as I don't like to say that. um, Duke is probably the most talented team overall left in in the tournament with Villanova. And with a bunch of really good teams getting knocked out, they look to be in a great spot. Except for the fact that Villanova's on their side of the bracket if they both make it to the Final Four. That's really the only bummer that I can think of if you're Duke. You, You wish you were on the other side where, you know, you've got no more Virginia, no more North Carolina, no more Arizona or Cincinnati. If they get to the Final Four and so does Villanova, that's going to be a tough matchup. But does Villanova have anybody that can really effectively guard Wendell Carter and Marvin Bagley? I'm not sure. 
Duvall's looked good. Trent's looked good. We know what Grayson Allen brings to the table. They're a really deep team with a bunch of first-round picks. And the matchup with Syracuse will be interesting. They're ACC opponents, so they see each other at minimum two times a year. Coach K and Jim Beheim hate each other, and I hate both of them. And look, when did you expect to see Coach K take something from Beheim? They're running his zone now, too. But look, Syracuse has won their games, not even scoring 60 points, okay? And that's going to be a problem because Duke is scoring a ton of points. 89 against Iona, 87 against Rhode Island. Syracuse only managed 57 against TCU and 55 against Michigan State. If Duke D's up and Syracuse only scores 55, 57, 60 points, there's no way that Duke is only scoring 60 points. As good as Syracuse has looked defensively, they're going to score more than that. And that's why I just don't know if Syracuse can hang with them, period. I I would be surprised. But again, it's been shocks galore, so who knows? Um, so I, I think Kansas and Duke probably get to the Elite Eight there because uh, I just don't think there's enough firepower for Syracuse. And though Clemson's looked really good against New Mexico State and Auburn, Kansas is a step up. So we'll see if they can handle that step. Looking at the West region, uh, Michigan State and Texas A&M. Uh, oh, not Michigan State, Michigan and Texas A&M. And of course, I had Michigan in the Final Four in this uh, region. So they still have a chance. Uh, obviously, not playing the team they expected to. Thought they would play North Carolina, which would have been one of the better matchups in the tournament. Uh, but instead, they get Texas A&M. And I think that North Carolina was a better matchup for Texas A&M because, again, like I talked about in the first segment, North Carolina doesn't really have the bigs that they have that they had last year, and the Aggies took advantage of that. And I don't really think that Texas A&M will be able to do that with Michigan because Michigan has better bigs. They've got that seven-footer. They've got Morris Wagner. So they've got some tall players that North Carolina really didn't have. And I think that's going to be a problem for Texas A&M, plus Abdul Rahman's been really good. Um, they, Michigan's got a deep team. And again, like Christian and I talked about last week, the best defensive team I think that John Beeline's ever had, and that's going to make a huge difference as well. In the other matchup, looking at Gonzaga, um, and r- really, I just want to look at Gonzaga first because um, you know they have been just unbelievable this season, winning over 30 games again. And of course, they lost Zach Collins. Nigel Williams, uh, Goss, made the mistake of leaving as a junior, didn't get drafted in the NBA. Um, But, you know, Rui Hachimura, uh, Perkins, they've still got some some good bigs, Jonathan Williams. And it just seems like Mark Few does it over and over and over again every single year and just gets it done. And, uh, you know, Gonzaga's got a good team. Uh, I, I know they weren't a one seed like they've been in the past, but they're still a really, really good team. And, you know, you, you have to be impressed by what they've done. And I would not be surprised to see Gonzaga move on to the Elite Eight. That would not shock me at all. Uh, they've got a tremendous team. And, again, they're deep in the backcourt. They're deep in the front court, And Mark Few has so much tournament experience now because Gonzaga is not a mid-major team anymore. They're just not. They're the furthest thing from it at this juncture. And this just shows you where my head is at. I didn't even mention Florida State beating Xavier, which is ridiculous. And I think I brought up Xavier earlier in the show, and and that just shows you how much my mind is blown that two one seeds are already out of the tournament, and we haven't even played the Sweet 16 games. But Xavier, who was my least impressive number one pick, you know, number one overall seed, I said that, uh, to Christian when we broke down the brackets. I was not really all that impressed with Xavier despite the kind of season they had. And they proved me right because they fell to Florida State in the round of 32, 75, 70. Leonard Hamilton, great win for him. He's done a very good job with that Florida State program, uh, but disappointing for Xavier as well. Uh, certainly not as big a disappointment as Virginia, um, but definitely a disappointment for Chris Mack. Would have expected him to win, but so... As you mentioned, or as I mentioned, that is the last team that's in the West region. So it's Gonzaga versus um, the number nine seed in Florida State. Um, And it would have been really interesting to see what Missouri could have been um, if they had 
had Michael Porter Jr. the whole season. Obviously, he only played a couple of games, played in that first round against Florida State, but he just wasn't himself because he really hasn't played because he was hurt. But Florida State versus Gonzaga, I definitely like the Zags for all the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, but Florida State, look, if they can beat Xavier, they're going to definitely put up a fight um, against Gonzaga as well. So I'm looking at the Zags and the Wolverines to come out of the West region. Going to take a break. NFL talk coming up inside the cheap seats. This is Sam Kirby, host of Cinema Stories here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Cinema Stories, where we hang out and just talk movie and TV news and reviews, and it's awesome. A new show comes out every single Tuesday. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Cinema Stories. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Welcome back inside the cheap seats here on the Public House Media Network. John Motor with you flying solo this week as Christian. That lucky young man is on vacation in Mexico. By the way, if you don't love this music, I don't know what to tell you, okay? Anybody that's listening to this music should be wanting to just bash through a wall right now and then punch a bunch of people in the face. NFL Films music is the best that you can get. I've managed to calm down a little bit after those first two um, segments with the NCAA talk. The tournament's just been insane. We all know that. Uh, But it's time to move on to a little bit of football. Don't forget, though you got to do a couple of things first. Got to go to the Facebook page, uh, the Cheap Seats Facebook page, like our page, also answer the daily poll question. And it's really simple this time around. I talked about it for two straight segments, so you should not be surprised. Brackets or no brackets? Do you fill out brackets? Do you not? As you know, I am done with brackets. I don't want to hear about another bracket. I don't want to spell bracket. I don't want to look at a bracket. How do you feel? Make sure you go to the Cheap Seats Facebook page to answer that. You can also go to the phmedia.com, learn more about all the shows on this tremendous podcast network. And you should be listening, devouring, taking in the Cheap Seats anywhere you can. iTunes, Spreaker, Google Podcasts, we're on iTunes. You name it, we're there, so check it out. So we're going to get into some NFL talk now. Obviously, this has been a pretty crazy offseason thus far. Um... Plenty of player movement in the NFL, some interesting trades. We're about a month out from the NFL draft, so things are really going to start to ratchet up and get more and more intense as as we get closer and closer. Obviously, the big get, the biggest free agent that was talked about the most, of course, was Kirk Cousins, finally picked his destination. You obviously know this. This happened you know, a few days back at this point, but three years, $84 million fully guaranteed to the Vikings. And to me, it was definitely the right choice. I know Christian and I have talked about this um, multiple times over the last couple of shows. Uh, to me, it was Minnesota and then everybody else. Uh, Denver was not as good an option. The Jets certainly were not as good an option. People were talking about Arizona as a possibility. To me, it was Minnesota and nowhere else. Okay, this is a team already made for the Super Bowl. They were a game away from the Super Bowl last year with Case Keenum, who, who, though he had a great season, he's not Kirk Cousins, okay? He's had one good year in the league. Kirk Cousins has had multiple good years in the NFL. To me, Minnesota was the prime spot for Kirk Cousins to go. These teams, this team and this player needed each other. Kirk Cousins could be the missing piece for Minnesota to get over the hump to get to the Super Bowl. And Cousins has never had a team nearly this good in Washington. It's such a dominant defense, good skill position players. You're going to have Dalvin Cook back this year, Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs, Kyle Rudolph, a very, very good offense and a tremendous defense. It made perfect sense for Kirk Cousins to go to Minnesota. Obviously, the Vikings are happy. I'm not too thrilled as a Packers fan that I've got Cousins in my division, uh, but, you know, the Packers have Aaron Rodgers and Cousins certainly isn't him. And though the money is obscene, This is going to be the going rate now for quarterbacks in the upper echelon of the league. Now, Kirk Cousins is not a top five quarterback. You can even debate on whether he's a top 10 quarterback. But you're not going to get a whole lot of guys that are throwing for 4,000 yards and 30 touchdowns with regularity. And that's what Kirk Cousins has done. Yes, I know his win-loss record is not that good. And he's obviously really had no playoff success. But again, Washington was a moribund disaster of a franchise. Daniel Snyder, one of the worst owners in sports. 
clearly that was not the best situation for any player. So I think you got kind of got to give Cousins a little bit of slack because of the organization he was in. Now, though, there's no excuses. The target is fully on him. There's going to be pressure on Kirk Cousins like he has not experienced in the NFL, okay? A player that once sat behind RG3 and really nobody knew what to expect of him is now the top-paid quarterback per year in the NFL. He's right up there, $28 million, and again, fully guaranteed. But I heard a lot of people over the last week or so say, oh my goodness, does this mean now that tons of NFL contracts are going to be fully guaranteed? And to me, the answer is no, okay? The NFL is known for not having fully guaranteed contracts for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it's a salary cap sport. And second of all, injuries happen every 30 seconds. Concussions, you know, uh, torn ACLs, broken bones, hurt this, hurt that. The NFL cannot survive with fully guaranteed contracts. Now, I do believe that players get the short end of the stick, for sure. I don't think there's any question about that. But I just cannot see the NFL moving to fully guaranteed contracts. Quarterbacks are a different animal. They're by far the most important position in the league. If you don't have a quarterback, you're absolutely nothing. We've seen that time and time and time again in the NFL. You need that leader under center. So, yes, will quarterbacks get more fully guaranteed contracts? Yeah, the upper echelon guys will. I'd be stunned if Aaron Rodgers' next contract with Green Bay was not fully guaranteed. I can't see how that doesn't happen. Okay? But, you know, Geno Smith is not going to get a fully guaranteed contract when and if he resigns uh, with another team. Okay? Just because this happened to Kirk Cousins does not mean that everybody's suddenly now going to get a fully guaranteed deal. And I can't see an offensive lineman or, you know, a linebacker getting a fully guaranteed deal. In this NFL, in 2018, I would argue that the four most important positions are quarterback, wide receiver, defensive end, and defensive backfield. Because it's a passing league. You need a quarterback. You need players that can catch passes from the quarterback. You need players that can rush the quarterback, and you need players that can defend the passes thrown by the quarterback. So those are the four positions that are the biggest in the NFL. Can you see any defensive end getting a fully guaranteed contract? Because I cannot. I don't care if it's Jadavion Clowney. I don't care if it's um, Joey Bosa. I don't care if it's Von Miller, uh, you know, J.J. Watt, Jade, whoever it is. I can't see any of them getting a fully guaranteed deal. Same with... Uh, Patrick Peterson or, um, you know, A.J. Bouye from uh, Jacksonville. Same with Odell Beckham, certainly not. Uh, Julio Jones, I just can't see that because they're not quarterbacks, okay? we. I'm sure that we're going to see more fully guaranteed contracts, but I'd be stunned if it was anybody other than the quarterback position. Breaking down the NFL here inside the Chief Seats, John Motta with you flying solo this week without Christian but we're getting it done. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at John underscore Lauder, J-O-N underscore L-A-U-D-E-R. You can follow Christian as well at Chris Heimel, C-H-R-I-S-H-E-I-M-A-L-L. Maybe if you're lucky, he'll post some of those bathing suit pictures from Mexico. We'll have to see. Uh, some other quarterbacks making moves as we get back into NFL free agency. Uh, some of the ones that stand out, Tyrod Taylor to Cleveland, A.J. McCarron to Buffalo, Josh McCown and Teddy Bridgewater to the Jets, Case Keenum to Denver, uh, Drew Brees staying in New Orleans, all interesting in one way or another. But I'm intrigued the most by Taylor and Bridgewater, to be completely honest. I'm intrigued to see if Tyrod Taylor can elevate Cleveland, and by elevate, I mean like three or four wins. I, I don't know if they're going to go from 0-16 to 7-9 and or 8-8. Eight and 8. I can't see that, despite the fact that I like what Cleveland has done. Tyrod Taylor is a middle-of-the-road quarterback, but he does not turn the football over. He's got some speed. So he does bring a different element than Cleveland has had of late. We'll see. And can Teddy Bridgewater get back to what he was a few years ago? Because a few years back, a lot of people thought he was sort of the next wave of great quarterback. He had a couple of nice seasons for Minnesota, sort of looked like he was going to turn the corner. Then, of course, he got hurt and really hasn't played the last two years. I think the Jets made a good move to sign him for just one year at $5 million. And you see what you can get out of him. Maybe he can win that starting quarterback job because whoever the Jets draft at three is not going to be the quarterback this season. I know you've got Josh McCown in the room as well. But Bridgewater is the guy that you should want to win the job. 
because if you play your cards right, you can have him back if you need him. I don't know, maybe halfway through the year you trade him if a team really needs a quarterback and they like what they see. Maybe you get some draft picks. I don't know. It's unlikely, but who knows? Some other notable free agent signings, Allen Robinson to the Bears. This might be my favorite free agent pickup for any team. Mitch Trubisky needs targets in Chicago. Allen Robinson, I know he was hurt this past year, but was a stud playing with a quarterback in Blake Bortles, who is a lot of times a pile of flaming hot garbage. I know he played well at times last year and had his moments in the playoffs, but this is not a top 10 quarterback by any means. And Allen Robinson at times made him look really good. So I do like Robinson a lot. A couple of the other ones that stand out, uh, Tyron Matthew uh, goes to Houston. I understand that Arizona didn't want to pay him what he wanted to get, but I think this was not a good move by uh, the Cardinals to let such a talented player go in their defensive backfield. Uh, my Packers get Muhammad Wilkerson and Jimmy Graham, both pieces that I really like. They need help on the defensive line, and they finally get a tight end that's worthy of getting footballs thrown to him from Aaron Rodgers. No offense to Martellus Bennett, um, you know, and and some of the other guys that that they've had on their roster, Jermichael Finley, uh, et cetera. Jimmy Graham is a legitimate top five tight end in the league, and even though he is getting up there in age, I believe he's 32, still a tremendous player and will do great things for the Packers in the red zone. Andrew Norwell to Jacksonville, they needed offensive line help. Um, Sammy Watkins to the Chiefs is one I don't fully understand. The Chiefs, of course, now are going with Patrick Mahomes as Alex Smith was traded to the Redskins. They've got some nice pieces on that team already in Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, um, the running back whose name, of course, is escaping me right this second, Kareem Hunt. Uh, so they've got some really talented offensive skill position players already. Sammy Watkins has been a disappointment since he came into the league. He's already been on a number of teams, Buffalo, LA now, uh, Kansas City, and they gave him a pretty big contract. I don't really understand that move, but, you know, look, Kansas City has been a good team for the last few seasons, uh, and we'll see what Mahomes brings to the table for them. Uh, moving now specifically to the Jets and Giants, um, you know, who's had the better off season? I think is an interesting discussion to have. Um, I, I like what the Jets have done so far, I have to admit. Signing Tremaine Johnson, yes, they overpaid him, but you often have to do that in free agency. They needed help in the defensive backfield. I like Bridgewater at only $5 million. They also picked up a Avery Williamson, uh, a linebacker they need. And Isaiah Crowell is a player I really like at running back. No, he's not you know, Ezekiel Elliott or LaShawn McCoy, but he's a solid back. They needed help there, especially because um, Matt Forte retired. But I don't really love the fact that they brought back Josh McCann. I know they really like him. They like the veteran presence in the room. But if you like him so much, hire him as a coach for two or three million. Why'd you have to hire him for ten or sign him for ten mil? Uh, to me, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I do know uh, that Todd Bowles has said that you know they're going to have McCallum be the starting quarterback. But I personally don't understand that. Uh, you only went five and eleven last year, despite McCown having arguably his best season in the league. Are you really going to do that much better this year? I just think that $10 million could have been spent better elsewhere. Uh, and I do think they should have kept Austin Safari and Jenkins. They don't have a tight end right now. They'll have to address that in the draft. Uh, but all in all, the Jets have made some nice moves. And same with the Giants. Nate Solder had to get him from the Patriots. Eric Flowers has been an abject disaster on the offensive line. You don't really have any tackles. So you had to bring in Nate Solder. But then, of course, you lose Justin Pugh to the Cardinals. So you gain one, you lose one. Um, Alec Ogletree and Kareem Martin are good pickups for uh, James Betcher's defense. Uh, and look, the Giants for years have been searching for linebackers that can do what you need from a linebacking core, okay? Not since the days of Lawrence Taylor and Carl Banks have we seen really good linebackers for the Giants. It's as if Jerry Reese was allergic to drafting linebackers with any sort of legitimate draft capital. So even though Ogletree makes a pretty good amount of money, I love that trade with L.A. And though I'm not a huge fan of Jonathan Stewart, I think he'll help in, in short sort of goal line situations for them. Uh, and look, the running game has been terrible because they've yet to find that real number one guy, and the offensive line's been a disaster. So anything you can bring in, I think, does help. I do believe the Jets have been a little bit better than the Giants thus far in the offseason, but again, the Giants had a better overall roster despite losing two more games 
than the Jets did. I still think the Giants have a better roster now than the Jets do. So I'm not really surprised that I'm more impressed by what the Jets have done. They need more. And I think both teams will look quarterback in the draft. I am far from a guru, but if I had to guess, uh, I would have Cleveland taking uh, Sam Darnold at one. I think the Giants will take Josh Allen at two. Then the Jets will take uh, Josh Rosen at three. And then the Browns will take Saquon Barkley at four. Again, I have no idea. The Bills could try and trade up. They've got those two first-round picks. Uh, So who knows what the Giants are going to do. But to be honest with you, though I understand why the Jets traded up to the third pick, I don't really love that they did it. I understand you need to be aggressive. And look, we saw this with the Eagles. They traded all those picks for Carson Wentz. Worked out beautifully. No one even really remembers what they gave up. Okay, if you get the right guy, yes, it's worth it. But are we sure about any of these quarterbacks? I'm certainly not. And guys that know a hell of a lot more about college football than me aren't real sure about them either. So I don't know if I would have given up three second-round picks when you're a team like the Jets that has so many needs, okay, to move up just three spots. Is that worth getting Josh Rosen as opposed to maybe Baker Mayfield? I don't know. Mayfield I don't like as much as the other three. But was it really worth moving up those three spots? Only time will tell for the New York Jets. But I think the Giants and the Jets will definitely be looking quarterback. Even though Christian and I have both said that we would not pick quarterbacks, I almost feel like Quentin Nelson, who is going to be a stud on your offensive line for a decade, and Saquon Barkley are better picks than one of these quarterbacks. Or trading down and getting a bounty of picks for that number two selection. But considering the Giants and the Jets, the goal is to not be at the top of the draft. The Giants haven't been in a long time. The Jets seem to be doing it perpetually every year now, but the goal is to not be in the top five. Maybe you get that quarterback and set yourself up to be picking towards the bottom of the first round for the foreseeable future. We're going to take one more break. When we come back, we'll wrap this thing up talking a little bit of NBA and also give you my mojo Monday. It's John Lauder flying solo without Christian Heimel here inside the cheap seats. This is Robert Gardner, host of Fantasy Wizards here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Fantasy Wizards, where we talk all about fantasy football. A new show comes out every Tuesday and Thursday night. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you'll never miss an episode of Fantasy Wizards. Thank you again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Yes, R. Kelly and Space Jam. You know we're talking NBA. Final segment here inside the Cheap Seats. John Lauder, uh, flying solo with you. Thank you so much for joining us, not only today, but every Monday. And also, you should be joining us every Wednesday and Friday as well, because our other hosts do a fantastic job, too, inside the Cheap Seats. And also, go to thephmedia.com. You can check out all the great things going on um, on the Public House Media Podcast Network. Listen to us on iTunes, Spreaker, you know, Google Play, et cetera, et cetera. Like the Facebook page, answer the daily poll question, brackets or no brackets, you know my stance, brackets are dead to me forever. And I feel like you should feel that way too, but you know what? That's up to you. I'm going to break down some NBA before we get on out of here. Uh, And the real story, as it's been all season long, has been uh, the Rockets and the Warriors. It's what we've been talking about forever at this point. Uh, And the Warriors are in a really interesting spot right now. It seems like everybody's getting hurt all at the same time, Um, you know. Clay Thompson's missed some time. Kevin Durant now is out for a couple of weeks. Steph Curry hurt as well. Uh, So Golden State's in a bit of a weird spot. And they're also three games back now of the Houston Rockets, who just continue to be dominant, 36-8 and in the conference now. They're 27-6 and at home, but 29-8 and on the road. And that's almost more impressive to me. To be in single digits in losses on the road proves just how good of a basketball team you are. The only other team that has single-digit losses on the road, no shock, is Golden State, who's 26-9. and um, Houston's 9-1 and in their last 10. James Harden, in my opinion, is on his way to the MVP. Um, it's been a spectacular season for the Rockets. And again, I, I, I feel like it's a broken record sort of over and over and over again, but who's going to beat either of these teams? 
it's got to be Golden State and Houston. I'd be stunned if they weren't in the Western Conference Finals. I just can't see this going any other way. Yes, Portland has been incredible of late. 12 straight wins. Damian Lillard is playing out of his mind right now. But even with those 12 wins, they're still 12 and a half back of Houston. Oklahoma City has started to pick it up a little bit of late. They're 8-2 and two in their last 10. They're 14 games over 500, and they're 14 games behind the Rockets. Okay, you look at Utah, New Orleans, who has done a tremendous job of staying afloat without DeMarcus Cousins. And quite frankly, you could argue that Anthony Davis could be the MVP with how he's played in the last month of the season. He has been in- spectacular, to put it mildly. Uh, so New Orleans has looked pretty good. But again, it really is Houston, Golden State, and everybody else. Now, if San Antonio can get Kawhi Leonard back in any sort of semblance of what he normally is, they could be interesting in the playoffs. But right now, they're tied in the fifth spot with Utah and New Orleans. Utah currently is fifth, New Orleans sixth, San Antonio seventh, but they're all 40 and 30. And if they finish in that seventh spot, you've got to play Golden State to start the playoffs, and that would not be a good look for San Antonio. And yes, I know Golden State's dealing with injuries, but the, the, to me, they're still the team to beat. As good as Houston has been, and they've been unbelievable, let, let there be no doubt, the Warriors still have two of the best five players in the world, and, oh, by the way, also have Thompson and Draymond Green. And with the experience that they have had over the last few years, I would just be really surprised if Golden State was not the team to win it all again, despite the injuries. If they can all be 100% healthy by the end of the season, they're going to be right where they want to be. And look, Quinn Cook just scored 28 points as the Warriors defeated Phoenix 124-109. Now, I know Phoenix is a dumpster fire, but you know Golden State is still a, is still a solid team, even without some of these players. And once they all come back, they're going to be exactly where they want to be. So, uh, no offense to the rest of the NBA, but I just cannot see any other team competing with the Warriors and the Rockets. And quite frankly, Golden State, to me, is the team to beat, period. Um, I, I, I just can't see even Houston beating Golden State when it really matters in the Western Conference Finals. As good as Houston's been, and they've been spectacular. But the Warriors have that playoff pedigree that Houston doesn't have. And at the end of the day, the Warriors coach is Steve Kerr, and the Rockets coach is Mike D'Antoni. And as good as Mike D'Antoni has been, he should be the coach of the year this year. He was obviously a really good head coach with Phoenix back in the 15 seconds or less era. He's still not Steve Kerr, period. And if I'm the Warriors, I'm still feeling really good about my situation despite the injuries. They're still, to me, the best team in the NBA. Breaking down the National Basketball Association here inside the cheap seats. John Lauder with you on the Public House Media Network. Uh, Looking at the Eastern Conference, I just find it so funny how those couple of games before the All-Star break, everybody, including my good friend and co-host Christian Heimel, were all over Cleveland looking spectacular in those two wins. And I said, well, hold up the brakes. Let's see what happens in the second half. And they've really been falling to, you know, down to earth. Cleveland is 11 and a half games behind Toronto. 11 and a half. Okay. Now, Toronto has been very good, of course. But the Toronto Raptors are nowhere near as good as Houston or Golden State. But they're 34 games above 500. They're 52 and 18. And Cleveland's 11 and a half games back, only 5 and 5 in their last 10 games. They only have a 500 record on the road. And it, look, look, LeBron is going to be LeBron every year at this point. It just, just doesn't seem like he's going to age. Okay, um, He joined Will Chamberlain as the oldest players to get, I think, 15 triple doubles in a season, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, LeBron's been ridiculous. But Cleveland just doesn't have enough. They give up 110 points per game. 110 points per game. It, it, there's just not enough there. Okay, these new pieces who are on their team now looked good to start and have had flashes, but none of them are Kyrie Irving. None of them are Kevin Love, of course, who's been hurt. 
Jordan Clarkson has his moments. Rodney Hood has his moments. Larry Nance Jr. has had his moments. None of them are good enough to be true second bananas to LeBron. None of them. And even to me, Kevin Love is not a second banana. He's like a, you know, a two and a half or a third banana. Okay? If LeBron doesn't get it done, what can you do? He had to score 33 points, grab 13 rebounds, and dole out 12 assists to lead Cleveland to just a five-point win over the lowly Bulls because, again, they have injuries and they're dealing with, you know, kind of a, a, a shorter roster right now. There's just not enough there. And I know the Toronto's had their trouble getting out of the East, and it's been all Cleveland and all LeBron. It's either Miami or Cleveland. It's been LeBron, LeBron, LeBron. To me, this is Toronto's year. If Toronto cannot get out this year, it's not going to happen for them. Yes, Boston has Kyrie, and they've had their moments too, but Toronto is only giving up 103 points per game, which is seven points per game less than Cleveland. Again, they are... 34 and 8 in the East. Just spectacular all the way around for Toronto this season. And again, they're doing it with a team that's, you know, kind of surprises you in a way. It just shows how good a coach Dwayne Casey has been because they're not that good a team. And, And I know that sounds ridiculous because they're 52 and 18, but. You look at the team statistically, and after DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry, there's not a lot there. There's just not a lot there. Serge Ibaka has had a a solid season, 12.6 points per game. Jonas Valanciunas, 12.5 points per game. C.J. Miles, who's, you know, an F player, 10 points a game. So they do have five players in double digits, but really it's DeMar DeRozan and then everybody else. Even Kyle Lowry's had a down year at only 16 points per game. But they are a deep team. Their roster is deep. Okay, you, you go down. Um, you know, they've got multiple players. Doing a little counting here. 11 players scoring five points a game or more. Norman Powell, OJ um, Anobi, Jacob uh, Podal, Pascal Siakam. I can't say that name. <laughs> Fred Van Vliet, DeLon Wright, CJ Miles. Just the kind of players that you think about when you think NBA, but all of them have sort of come together and it's worked. It's worked. Okay? And another thing that sort of interests me and will be big for the playoffs, they're a really good free throw shooting team. And I know a lot of times you don't think about that, but I've been thinking about it a lot recently because watching the last two minutes of these college games, and I know I talked about this earlier, watching the end of these college games is like pulling out your teeth because all these teams are... terrible in regards to shooting free throws, and they just struggle immensely uh, at the end of games, Toronto is a really good free throw shooting team, okay? You look at their top seven scores, they're all 80% or better at the free throw line. DeMar DeRozan, 83%. Kyle Lowry, 85%. Serge Ibaka, 81%. Jonas Valanciunas, 81%. CJ Miles, 83%. DeLon Wright, 84%. Fred Van Vliet, 86%. That's huge that your top seven scorers all shoot 80% or better at the foul line. That means that you're not going to have a hack of Shaq or a hack of DeAndre or anything like that at the end of games because all your players can hit free throws. And that that might seem minuscule, but I assure you that it is not when you're coming down to the end of a close game in the NBA playoffs. You want your players to be able to hit clutch free throws and Toronto should be able to do just that. Before we get on out of here, I'm going to give you my Mojo Monday. I'm going to do the good and the bad Mojo because Christian's not here, and it's going to come from the same exact game. The good Mojo's got to be for UMBC. When you're the first 16 seed to be the one seed, you're getting good Mojo from here to the end of the earth. And look, I know that the Retrievers lost to Kansas State in the round of 32, and that was disappointing, but they're history forever, okay? When you look at that, you know, number one seeds are 135 and one all time against 16 seeds going into next season's NCAA tournament. UMBC is that one. And they played a game that you, you, you may never see again from a 16 seed because they didn't just squeak by. They destroyed Virginia. It was an embarrassment for the Cavaliers. And they're my bad mojo. Okay. 
I'm not suggesting Tony Bennett's not a great coach. He's built that Virginia program up to heights it really hasn't seen since Ralph Sampson and maybe ever. But until they can figure out a way to make this slow, slogging, defense-first team into a team that can be successful in the tournament, Tony Bennett is always going to be looked at as the guy that just could not get it done when it really mattered. Because they have just had so many struggles in the NCAA tournament. And a 16 seed in UMBC just sort of re-exposed the troubles that Virginia has had the last couple of years. That's going to wrap it up for us here inside the cheap seats, or really just for me. John Lauder here with you. Christian will be back with me next week. We'll break down the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight. So much more college basketball to come, more NFL free agency, NBA, and more. And we're getting closer to Major League Baseball. (laughs) You'll notice I didn't hit on it in this show because we'll be talking about it plenty when Christian comes back. Thank you so much, as always, for listening. Make sure to like our Facebook page and answer the daily poll question. And once again, this has been John Lauder inside the Cheap Seats.